Good evening to everyone. I welcome you all to Envis webinar theme, Know Your Ecosystem. And today's topic is Distribution and Fe Feeding Ecology of Himalayan Grey Langur in Kashmir, Himalaya by Dr. Mehreen Khalil. Mehreen has finished her PhD from Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore on the uh, distribution activity and feeding of Himalayan Grey Langur in Kashmir, Himalaya. And she has finished her du dual BSMS from ISER Mohali and is currently heading a Kashmir-based NGO on Wildlife Research and Conservation Foundation, which is WRCF, which aims to bring awareness to local people about the biodiversity of Jammu and Kashmir. Mehreen has also given lectures in various schools and colleges of Kashmir and also has worked as a researcher in wildlife department. So it's an immense pleasure to welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. Mehreen Khalil uh, for today's webinar. Over to you, Mehreen. Thanks a lot, Dipti. It was really a pleasure to you know, come and talk here. Um, I'm uh, glad that you invited me and found me worthy to give a talk here. So without taking further of uh, my time, I would just start my presentation. So um, the title of my presentation is Distribution and Feeding Ecology of Himalayan Grey Langur. So before I go into the details of what I am uh, planning to show you today, I will just go through some basics of uh, primatology or as to say taxonomy. So primates um, are uh, okay. primates are uh, a very large and diverse uh, taxonomical order and primate is a member of that primate um, order and um, there are very striking features of um, which primatologists have defined for primates such as uh, front facing eyes for uh, shortened muzzle, contoured uh, palms of hands and soles of feet, and 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 uh, an opposable thumb, which is one of the important feature of a, a primate. Apart from having external air, body hairs, they also have flat nails instead of claws. So most of their uh, all of their fingers have flat nails, but there are a, a set of uh, primates uh, which have both claws as well as flat nails. I'll come to, um, I'll discuss that in uh, uh, in my next slides. And what primates can do is that they can stand upright to a varying degree. So taxonomists have classified them in two major uh, groups called prosimians and simians. Primates are as old as um, 50 to 85 uh, million years old and um, the oldest are the prosimians. Uh, so, um, lorises, uh, lemurs, and tarsiers form this uh, group of prosimians. And what is interesting about these are that they are nocturnal. They have very large eyes, as you can see in the picture here. Most of them are insectivorous, and they have something called a grooming claw or a toilet claw. Uh, if you can see my pointer here, they there uh, one of the digit one of the fingers have a claw. This is very uh, this is a important characteristic of uh, prosimians. Mostly all uh, prosimians have this, which is absent in the other group called the simians. So all the monkeys or uh, langurs, baboons, apes, and humans come in another group called the simians. So simians. They, they, they can be, um, you know, differentiated into two groups taxonomically. These are called platyrrhines or the flat-nosed or the catarrhines. So, as I said, that taxonomists have differentiated them based on certain anatomical features. Uh, platyrrhines, as I said, they are called flat-nosed. They have their nose, nose nostrils on the outside out-facing out nostrils whereas catarrhines have downward facing nostrils this is the one of the uh, striking feature of these two categories and then the monkeys which are found in the new world as to say uh, for example such as uh, the south america central uh, central america as well as mexico these are called uh, those monkeys are called as new world monkeys. For example, this monkey here, it's a spider monkey. And 
um, you can easily say that something is different about this uh, spider monkey, and that is they have a prehensile tail, which is absent in their counterpart monkeys, which is the old world monkeys. The prehensile tail meaning that they use this tail as an extension to their body, and uh, they can use this as uh, as they use their limbs. For for example, they can hang using this tail and uh, feed, drink water, and things like that, which is um, which is entirely absent in the new world monkeys. Uh, sorry, in the old world monkeys. And the old world monkeys, as their name suggests, are the monkeys which are found in the old world, parts of Africa and Asia. Um, these are langurs, baboons. If you can um, identify a few of the langurs in this, this is a golden langur, which is found in India. And a um, line-tailed macaque, which is an endemic um, macaque, an endemic and endangered macaque in the Western Ghats of India. So these are called old world monkeys. They don't have a prehensile tail as the new world monkeys. They have that they, they have few characteristic uh, differences. For example, old world monkeys um, 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 are mostly leaf eating monkeys. They have uh, um, okay, and then there are apes and humans. They are they have been put in a separate. Uh, um, in a separate uh, family or subfamilies of uh, uh, catarines in under apes there are greater apes such as chimpanzees and baboons uh, sorry chimpanzees and uh, gorillas and lesser apes the hulog gibbon for example and uh, in humans we have different races of humans um, under this so colloquially all um, monkeys all together excluding humans are called as uh, non-human primates. So taking a glance at the primates of India, we have around 24 species of primates, which is a very diverse group of, which is a very diverse number of uh, primates, whereas the biggest is the Himalayan grey langur. Uh, it is as big and it can weigh up to 20 to 25 kgs. Whereas the smallest is the Malabar Grey Slender Loris, which is so small that it can easily fit in, in your palm. Um, here in the picture is the, uh, the Slender Loris. The most common, as you might already be knowing, that is, um, is a rhesus macaque. It is a notorious uh, macaque. You can easily see it near temples uh, in Shimla and in um, urban settings now they have started to come up in urban, urban settings and so are the bonnet macaques these are the most common primates which can, you can easily see and find in india india also has one of the um, only ape species called the hulock gibbon here in the picture they are sexually uh, dimorphic uh, uh, species of primates the male and the female look different and uh, uh, they are found in the northeastern parts of india in assam and other parts there is a specifically there is a, a conservation reserve named as um, a hulanga park gibbon wildlife sanctuary and it is a home of these uh, gibbons in india so during my phd i got an opportunity to work um, on the himalayan grey langurs in kashmir and I will be talking about some of the results of uh, what we found out. But before that, uh, it belongs to um, genus Seminopithecus, which is most, which is only found in the Indian subcontinent. The genus Seminopithecus, or commonly called as Hanuman langurs or grey langurs. The various uh, species have been identified throughout the Indian subcontinent all the way from uh, down south to north uh, in the Himalayas. And the species which is found in the Himalayan uh, range are called the Seminopithecus cystaceous. So earlier there were some confusions that taxonomically people were not able to differentiate uh, populations in other parts of um, Himalayas and uh, in, the, in the northwestern Himalayas. 
So now, uh, very recently, there uh, just two days ago, a paper has been published from uh, my colleagues uh, Kunal and uh, from CES. They have established that this is a single species uh, called Seminopithecus cystaceus, which is found in the in the in the Himalayas. So the ones uh, so not uh, commonly in English, they are called as Himalayan grey langurs. So before I go into the details, just a quick uh, um, uh, basic uh, refresh. Refresh. Um, so we'll just refresh our basics. So uh, general identification. So there is no um, sexual dimorphism, as to say, between the male and the female. Both of them look alike um, once they are on a treetop. But um, um, you can easily differentiate between a male and a female. Female has mammary glands, male doesn't have. This picture is to show the, uh, the differences in sizes. Juveniles are smaller in size compared to an adult male. As I said previously, um, both males and females can weigh up to 20 to 25 kg. So they are very huge, they are very bulky and have a lot of fur. They are arboreal, like other grey langurs. That is, they mostly uh, prefer feeding um, or doing their other active behavioral activities on uh, treetops. They usually they usually sit there. For example, they they can they sleep, they roost, or they feed on trees. But they also come down a few few times to drink water. For example. Langurs, like other langurs, are usually leaf-eating monkeys. They are also called as leaf-eating monkeys. They have uh, different kinds of uh, physiologies to uh, digest large amounts of leaves, the cellulose in these leaves. These are called saculated stomachs, and they mostly mostly feed on leaves. Their diet consists uh, Less, um, lesser amounts of insects, but the diet mostly has leaves. And they sometimes come on the ground to feed on grasses as well. The Himalayan langurs, they live in very large groups compared to the uh, langurs found in the plains. When I say large groups, I mean groups as large as 300 individuals, 350 individuals. And three different types of groups of in um, uh, primates or in primate societies have been identified, but in langurs they usually prefer in prefer uh, uh, multi male multi female groups. That is, there are more more males and more females. There are also uni male and uh, multi male uh, sorry uni male and um, all male band. That is. Uh, where there is only males in the group and where there is there is only a, one single male in the group so the troop here you can see is a multi male multi female troop and um, one of the interesting thing about Him uh, himalayan langurs is that these groups disintegrate during summer season and they form smaller groups and these smaller groups again when winter starts to arrive, these smaller groups congregate and form very large groups. This is known to be associated um, to the availability of resources, and uh, this is one of the features of the Himalayan Nangurs. Usually, um, the female gives birth to a single infant. There are but there are times when it uh, very rare okay on very rare occasions the female gives birth to um, two individuals as well they they wean for around uh, they they breastfeed for um, mostly around 2 to 3 months and then uh, after that uh, they start eat you know copying their mother what what she she's feeding they'll also try to copy her and feed that's how they learn to pick up things and uh, feed on things 
so the the infants here are not very old as in they are they must be around 3 uh, or 4 months old that is when they start to grow um, gray hair on their body and their faces and uh, hands and feet start to turn black but as soon as the infant is born um if you can clear see here in the picture it is a brown colored um baby with no fur on the body its hands and feet are uh, like light brown in color they have not turned black so these these are very uh, small it must be around a week old um, infant here in the picture so the infants are conspicuous and uh, they always are carried by their mothers wherever they go in the picture here you can see a mother is carrying its infant while movement so why is this um, important studying the primates or the langurs in high altitude so one of the reason is that we are trying to bridge the knowledge gaps about their ecology and about their distribution in the himalayas and kashmir is the region where not not many people go and study animals in kashmir so there is a knowledge gap and we are trying to bridge that gap another thing is that this study can help us you know ask a lot of questions about how high altitude primates are surviving in such harsh conditions and also help us conserve them and the plant species that they prefer feeding on so that is how it creates a link um between uh, you know conserving the flora and fauna so as i said earlier that himalayan grey langurs are found in the himalayas we have been knowing this for quite a long time from 1975 we know that himalayan langurs are uh, existing in himalayan system but there there have been studies which have only looked at their social structures or uh, um, um, social structures in different um, habitats um, and these studies are mostly from places in nepal from uttarakhand and himachal but in the north western uh, himalayan region there are only reports of presences for example in chamba kishtwad and dachi gam in kashmir there are only reports of presences there has been no long term study on their behavior and ecology as to say so my uh, so what we have been trying is to understand how um, where first thing where they are distributed in the north western himalayan himalayas or the kashmir himalaya and second what is their feeding ecology so in the picture here um, this is the map of kashmir region it is an oval shaped valley here in the center is srinagar and the, this this uh, blue shaped uh, thing is dal lake this valley is surrounded by uh, mountains on all the sides peer panchal on the left kishtwad zabarwan and kishan ganga ridge so we have been asking questions um and uh, where they are distributed in this landscape in kashmir himalayas and we used gis as well as interviews in ground surveys to assess their distribution so when i say ground surveys we mean um i mean that i go to places and see if langurs are present or not and also ask people separately interview them if they have whether they have seen monkeys or langurs in their region or not so it turns out that um it turns out that langurs are found in the mountainous regions of the valley they are not found in the lower parts of the valley that is uh, the oval shaped valley that i showed you they are only found present in the um in the mountains of kashmir the graph here shows that um, shows the proportion of people who were survey who were uh, asked about the presence of langurs the greens are the ones where all people, 10 out of 10 people told me that their langurs are present in this region when we compared this result with the ground surveys that is what when 
I went there and I uh, whether I have seen monkeys or not in that region. So they showed a l accordance with each other. That means uh, what people had told me and what I also saw is that langurs were actually present only in the mountains and in the forests of Kashmir. What these results also establish is that they are also found in the northwestern regions of Kashmir, which is in Uri or um, the Kazinag National Park. They are, they, are, they are also present there. So they, these results establish that langurs, the Himalayan grey langurs, are widely distributed in the Himalayas. They are not on, they, are, they don't have a specific range, and they are widely distributed in the region. When we looked at the different habitat types that they prefer, it was found out that they prefer deciduous as well as coniferous habitats. That's why their presence are in um, mountains of the valley. That's where these kinds of habitats are present. And what is interesting is that they are absent in the plantation, cropland, or urban and urban. Um, habitats. That means no interaction with, very less interaction with humans as to say. We also found out that langurs prefer a elevation, an elevation range from 1700 to 3000 meters. So these results establish the a wider range of langurs in the, in the Himalayas as to say the different habitats that they prefer and the different and the elevation range that they are present in. What is the next question that we tried to ask was, if langurs are present in such seasonal habitats of Himalayas, because Himalayas have seasonality of winter, summer, winter and summer, how do they adapt to certain kinds of, um, you know, how do they adapt to this seasonality? So. The thing, the the question that we ask is, how do these animals or how do langurs interact with the environment? So we uh, study something called activity budgeting. So it is it is an interaction of animals with the environment has been largely studied in many colubines. Colubines are the groups of um, the family of langurs or uh, the family. Uh, these langurs belong to and there are various factors which are known to influence these activity patterns such as seasonality it affects temperature and food availability so when temperatures are different langurs are going to um, adapt you know they are going to adapt differently to different different temperatures and food availability also affects their activity patterns for example, when food availability is low in winter, that is when not much food is available in winter, langurs or animals in general are expected to spend more time in feeding or in searching for more food. Temperature or, uh, or temperature or um, animals thermoregulate in different temperatures and animals uh, are expected to spend more time feeding and resting so the question that we have asked is how does seasonality influence these activity budgets of himalayan langurs so we do this in uh, we have done this in uh, dachigam the map here you can see is of dachigam national park the uh, these are the boundaries of dachigam national park it is around um, 20 kilometers away from srinagar city and you can see wherever you whenever you go to the Achigam, you can easily see langurs over there so we chose this as our intensive study area the Achigam valley as such has um has a very different um, landscape they have broadleaf deciduous in the lower parts of the valley and uh, patches of conifer towards hills the lower uh, deciduous valley has uh, uh, prunus um, willows elm, elms etc as 
uh, dominant species this is this is a picture of the valley in summer and this is how it appears in winter when there are no leaves available and when it snows everything is covered in snow and there is not even a single leaf so the question is how do these animals survive when they are leaf eating monkeys and they don't have a single leaf at all so what we found out is that during winter they spend most of their time feeding as compared to summer so the graph here in so the first bar here you see is blues are the winters and the reds are the um, uh, uh, summer season summer bars and we see we found found out that they are present uh, sorry that they feed more during winter as compared to summer and the rest more in summer they also um they are also they also spend most of the time in other social activities so since um, in this talk here i'm mostly interested in their feeding so we'll just zoom into their feeding activity so when we looked at their seasonal feeding on different plants we found out that they feed on bark buds young leaves mature leaves ripe fruits and seeds and they spend a significantly greater amount of their time feeding on bark buds young leaves and seeds in winter <coughs> than in summer whereas in summer they shift their diet feeding on ripe fruits and mature leaves so what these results suggest that there is a shift in their diet and they prefer feeding on whatever is available in winter to them and once their preferred foods become available in summer they shift their diet to what they want to eat and when we looked at the different plant species that they feed on do they show any preference for that or not we found out that in um, summer they prefer feeding on fruits of mulberry which is morus species and walnut which is juglans regia so of walnut they crack open the walnut and um, eat the nut um, so for mulberry they don't need to they don't have to process the fruit as such so they show a preference for these two different um, plant species in summer whereas in winter langurs feed on the seeds and bark of um, willow and seeds of ulmus ulmus is a kind of an elm and salix um, is uh, willow so they feed on bark so the previous picture uh, that i showed you where and where these langurs were sitting on a tree top they were actually feeding on bark and that is a picture from winter so the interesting questions that we are trying to address are what are the nutritional values that they are trying to get from these uh, plant parts it is understandable that while when they are feeding uh, seeds they get some amount of oils or fats but how can bark be a replacement for uh, their diet that is something that one needs to ask so um i think i have um, gone too fast i don't know so the take home message from here is that sorry the take home message is that the langurs have a very wider uh, geographical range they were previously thought to be present in a smaller range and now this study shows that they have a very wide geographical range and their ability to shift their diet in these seasonal habitats this makes them very adaptive of uh, surviving in different in these different geographical conditions it's not that the himalayan langurs are the only ones which have been um, now known to shift their diet there are various animals um, various primates as to say 
which shift their diet in seasonality and that gives them this ability to adapt to such that is why primates are the most adaptive um, order of the animal kingdom so these uh, these studies which um, understand their ecology they it has also opened avenues for conservation where initially we did not know much about the different plants they prefer the different species they uh, feed on now we have an idea of what to um, you know conserve in terms of plant species um, the native plant species need to be conserved more because the the plants that they prefer feeding on these are mostly native plant species and they have some economical value as well for example the mulberry has economical value as well so we need to conserve these uh, plant species to save the langurs in the longer run um as dipti already mentioned before we also do um, conservation and uh, education awareness programs so initially when i started this work not many people would know that langurs are found in kashmir and they are locally called as wandur but not many people from the plains uh, plains i mean to say from the valley uh, the lower parts of the valley knew that langurs are present present and this is quite understandable because langurs do not come in contact with uh, humans they are very shy monkeys and they are mostly seen in forests so whoever goes to forest there might be a chance that they would see langurs over there it's not like the langurs of the plains uh, where you can just go and see langurs everywhere uh, it's not like that um, the langurs here in kashmir have very less interaction with humans that is why there is very low conflict associated with them so we do conservation and awareness programs we go to schools and colleges and teach uh, the kids teach students about the behavior the basic behaviors just we try to build interest in them in uh, specifically in primatology because it's a field which not many people uh, uh, take and this is it's it's a very interesting field to um, you know if you are interested in animal behavior it's a very interesting field to take so in these schools and colleges we um, interact with students do quizzes wildlife uh, programs we also uh, give them audio visuals so that they get to know they get a feel of what is there present in their uh, surroundings and they are not aware of that i would like to thank my uh, supervisors uh, dr shumanto bagchi from center for ecological sciences and uh, dr rohini balakrishnan from center for ecological sciences who have mentored me in this um, journey um inspire for funding this project uh, rafford foundation the distribution uh, part of the chapter the the thesis was funded by rafford it the i showed you just the tip of the iceberg but what goes behind all these things is a lot of effort so we need funds for that of course um, iic and uh, ces and the department of uh, wildlife protection from uh, of jnk for giving us permits to work in protected areas and to understand this very enigmatic species uh, which most people don't understand the uh, importance of um i'm just doing a advertisement here uh, we are also associated with the association of indian primatologists it is a small um, um it is a small initiative by the primate primatologists in india and we are doing a basic course in primatology if uh, you are interested you can just go to their website and register yourself the registration fees is very low you uh, the courses are being conducted by instructors um, who have expertise in primatology these are um, indian instructors mostly and 
mostly Indian students are encouraged to take these courses. And um, that's what we are trying to do. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I have finished my presentation. I don't know if I ran too quickly or, uh, yeah, over to you, Dipti. Yeah, Marina, uh, you have taken 35 minutes. So we have uh, two questions. I think you can answer them. Uh, first one is from uh, Romi Kumari. She's asking, uh, is there any difference in the behavior found, found from uh, previous langus due to human interference or climate change? Sorry, I didn't get any difference in the behavior found from previous langus due to human interference or... Um, by previous langurs, I don't know what is meant by previous langurs. So, so this is a very difficult question to say. So we need to have, you know, long-term studies to understand their behavior. In Himalayas, this is there have not been many long-term studies. As compared to uh, southern India, there have been long-term studies, but I don't know if there are. Uh, differences in their behavior as such due to climate change. Human interference is yes, their feeding habits are changing. They are preferring more uh, human food as compared to what was available in the forest. So yes, their feeding habits are changing in that sense. In terms of uh, climate change, I don't know. Um, actually, it's very difficult to comment. effect of climate change on feeding behavior yeah exactly i don't know so these questions um, these are very good questions and very interesting questions to ask but you need to have um, constant studies of feeding behavior so this was the first study done in such a um, habitat on feeding so hopefully we are planning to continue this and uh, let's see what happens what where we can reach Thank you, Tariq. If you have any questions, you can ask. Um, I see. Happy Did you answer. have any questions? Yeah, there is a question. What is the difference between monkeys and langus? So monkeys is a generic term for all and uh, langurs are different than so there are baboons there are langurs um, so i don't know uh, if we can uh, so in the earlier slides i showed you different uh, primates different uh, groups of primates so there were lorises there were prosimians and there were uh, apes uh, baboons, maca macaques and all, they were all simians. So monkey is a very generic term to say. It includes all monkeys and langurs are very specific langurs. Thank you. I just want to know about vegan behavior in grey langur, if any, since it's seen in Uttarakhand region. So begging behavior um, I don't know if it has been seen in langurs, but macaques are very famous for their pegging behavior. Um, in Uttarakhand, I know people are working on uh, behavior of uh, grey langurs. And it's quite understandable because primates are, um, you know, very intelligent species and they learn once one individual starts begging and they get a food. Uh, from human, they, the others will quickly learn. So uh, this is not this will this won't be any surprising if langurs also start begging one day. Yeah, but macaques are quite known to beg for uh, they bargain actually for uh, food in Shimla. There are studies which have uh, shown this.
Thank you, Anupana. Are there any more questions? I think there are no more questions. Uh, okay. I have one uh, small observation. Why uh, monkeys ran away by seeing the langurs? So, uh, langurs were previously used to uh, chase away uh, macaques, actually, because there was a lot of uh, issue of, um, you know, macaques coming to places, to humans' um, habitats and stealing their food. And they, they were used because just only because of their size. They were used to chase away macaques. But in wild, I have seen both uh, macaques and langurs feeding together in the same patch. And mostly it's the langur which, uh, you know, uh, shies away. The macaques are very, uh, uh, what to say, aggressive as such. They chase away uh, langurs in wild. But yeah, I don't know it's, if it's a good practice to use uh, animals for all such activities. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. No more uh, questions, I guess, Seto. Yeah. Uh, I think there, is, there are no more questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I would... Uh, just before you uh, say anything deeply, I would request yes. the students from colleges to take up this course if they are really interested in primatology. So these courses are, um, you know, instructors are very friendly instructors. Some of the big names in primatology um, are there. If you are really interested in this, please take up this course. It is really going to be very helpful. It's a very basic course and you can all uh, take this course. I think, Mary, there's one more question uh, uh, where uh, Anju Kumari is asking, do they survive in adverse condition? So, yeah. Um, the, so what I showed you here is is a uh, explanation of their survival in these conditions. By adverse conditions, we mean... So when we think of Himalayas, we think the conditions are very, very uh, harsh. But we need to understand th these are harsh for us in our perspective. Are they really harsh for them? Because they have been surviving there. They have been living there. And they have adapted different strategies to you know, sustain in these, uh, uh, in these um, habitats. So they adapt various behavioral uh, shifts. For example, feeding was one of the interesting behavior shifts that they do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is one of the fact that they survive. Do they poach these langus for their fur? Um, no. In Kashmir, because as I said, the interactions, the human inter uh, human langur interactions are very low. They don't poach. And uh, they don't even... Um, you know, come in conflict with humans. So there is no, actually, there are no reports of poaching. Not, uh, I came across. And, um, but there are instances where people kill langurs, not for um, their fur, just because they come and raid their crops. And um, I don't, uh, but they, yes, there are uh, places in China where bushmeat is, preferred you know they eat monkeys or eat uh, other kinds of uh, monkeys for meat not in india i have not uh, seen it. yeah i think uh, there are no more questions uh, if you can You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Yeah. They uh, like worship langurs in uh, Kashmir. Like, do they have some religious uh, belief or uh, like, you know, killing them is like a taboo or something? 
so there is a certain religious belief that these are lesser that they, these langurs were lesser humans that is why mm-hmm. you know they were bad humans which were um converted uh, to become monkey uh, there are certain beliefs like that in here and most of the population is uh, muslims they don't uh, worship them as such but they don't uh, you know touch them because of the same reasons that they were those humans which were not uh, rejected from the religious belief and that is why they became uh, langurs these were those humans that became langurs there is this belief and um, no they don't uh, worship them or they don't kill them i have not seen killing but but yes um, there are few places and few incidences where langurs come and raid crops which are very close to the protected areas langurs come and raid crops uh, and uh, humans just uh, you know uh, chew them away by throwing stones or cracking uh, firecrackers but they don't kill them as such Okay thank you Marine so i think uh, there are no more questions so i would like to conclude this uh, webinar session for the day so i would uh, re- uh, extend my appreciation to uh, Marine Dr Marine Kalir for uh, uh, giving us this wonderful talk on uh, himalayan grey langurs and also uh, thanks to all the participants who have participated in this webinar and have uh, asked really interesting uh, questions uh we look forward to uh, the same kind of participation in our uh, further webinars uh, thank you so much uh, marine thank you so much deepthi always a pleasure <laughs>